All righty, guys, or ladies and gentlemen, I should start saying, considering we've actually started getting uh, a few females uh, from the analytics, which is uh, great. Um, you guys, uh, as usual, please like, subscribe, share if you haven't already. We're getting close to the uh, 3,500 mark subscriber-wise, which is astronomical. Never thought we'd ever get that high, um, but we're we're going. So, uh, and to to kind of end the month, uh, we really got a wonderful wonderful guest today. Uh, I've really slacked off, and I apologize to everyone, including Mr. Dick. Uh, we, we've really not gotten a team coverage on here uh and i i want to apologize about that but i thought no better way for the first time covering an a team and to end the month we have none other than mr richard james aka slurp um some of you uh i would assume a lot of you will know mr james from his books which i'm going to pull up i don't have my copies yet they are on the way but these are his four copies covering his time in special forces uh book one two three and four uh we've got a lot of photos as y'all can imagine which this is going to be a, a lot of fun showing um these books are listed in the show notes so if y'all uh are, are interested in some some very good stuff on the A-teams. And also, you're going to hear about Africa today. Um, I, I recommend getting these books. I've already ordered mine. So if y'all follow what I, what I buy, that tells you, go buy it. Um, without further ado, before I talk us into uh, a bore, I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Dick. And Mr. Dick, thank you very much for joining us today. Hope you're doing well, and the floor is yours, sir. Yep. Uh, to begin with, <clears throat> I was born in Flushing, New York, and I always tell my friends I was not flushed down the drain. So I started out in October 7th in Flushing, New York, and then my mother moved to Grandma's in Bedford, Pennsylvania, because my dad went to Africa. This was uh, during World War II and, and dad was in the airlines. So he was sent to Africa and South America to work there. And then in October of 1946, we moved to Limerick, Ireland. That was because of his job in, in the airlines. We lived in Limerick for two years and then moved. Oh, by the way, in Limerick, the first school I went to was called Leprechaun School. It was first grade, and I actually have, still have the cap from there, and it has a little leprechaun on the front of it. Then in 1948, we moved to Stockholm, Sweden. And we stayed in Stockholm, Sweden for three years. I went to three different schools in Stockholm, Sweden. I've, in fact, I've gone to 10 different schools in my 12 years of schooling. So I've moved around a lot. From, uh, from Stockholm, well, by the way, in Stockholm, it was, the classes were taught in Swedish. And being a young man, and I've also had uh, people tell me that I'm very good at learning foreign languages. So in Sweden, the schools that I went to were actually taught in Swedish using the Swedish language, which I had learned very well, very quickly. Then in 1951, January 1951, we moved to Bedford, uh, Pennsylvania again. We stayed there for half a year. And then <clears throat> dad had bought a house in Castro Valley, California. That's in the San Francisco Bay Area in the very south of it. And uh, 
we moved to a motel there until the house was finished. We stayed in that motel for two months and then finally moved into our new home in Castro Valley. In September, I began school in uh, A.B. Morris Junior High School in Castro Valley. After that, I went on to high school, began attending Castro Valley High in September of 1956. And then we moved to Carmel, California, Carmel by the sea. And I attended Carmel High School for two and a half years before graduating. And I, right after that, I graduated in 1960 and we immediately moved to San Jose, California. And I started school in San Jose, um, San Jose State College. I, I figured since I grew so quickly <clears throat> during my freshman year, I would be great playing basketball. So I signed up for the freshman basketball team. It was amazing what happened there. I was no good as a basketball player. But I worked as hard as I could. And even though we had some uh, people who were there on grants for their basketball ability, they were kicked off a team and I stayed on. <clears throat> and at the end, I asked him why he kept me on. And he said, because you showed exertion you worked hard the whole time and I wanted everybody to see that. And I found out later after I graduated from uh, special forces school and visited him, I found out that he was an original Green Beret. So that kind of, and, and I had never known that before. So that was great to know. Okay. In February, on February 14th, as a matter of fact, of 1962, I enlisted U.S. Army Airborne. The reason I picked February 14th was because it was Valentine's Day. My girlfriend had broken up with me, uh. and she started going with another guy, and I thought, I'm going to get even. I'm going to enlist on Valentine's Day. Well, sure shooting, while I was in uh, basic training, I got a letter from her fiance. It was a Dear John letter from a fiance. And he said, his words were, since you decided to prepare for war, we, put up, we fell in love. So that was I got that while I was out in the field during basic training. To begin with, I signed up and went to San Jose, downtown San Jose, to actually take the oath. And then from there, we all got on a peerless stage bus and we went down to Fort Ord, California. At Fort Ord, I took basic training at headquarters and headquarters company, first battle group, first brigade. And I received in March, the following month, I received my first army paycheck, which was all of $78. By the way, when we first got to basic, we got a, a, a $20 uh a flying 20, I think they called it. That was for buying the stuff that we needed to get to put in our food foot locker. I graduated from basic training in April of 62 and immediately began advanced individual training. 
the army decided that I should be a heavy weapons man. Heavy weapons to them meant mortars and recoilless rifles. So I went through that training for a couple of months. And I'm glad I did because in Vietnam, I used my heavy weapons uh, taught very well because I, I actually worked a couple of times as a mortar man on the team. Okay, in June, I was x-rayed for pneumonia and I was recycled. So there went a delay. In, 60, in, in July of 1962, I began qualifying for the 106 recoilless rifle. And I tied the record, the post record for that with a perfect score of 240 points out of 240 firing that uh, recoilless rifle. Wow. On July 28th, I graduated from AIT. AIT, by the way, stands for Advanced Individual Training. A lot of people call it Advanced Infantry Training, but it's actually Advanced Individual Training. August 24th, which was four weeks away, I finally arrived at Fort Benning, Georgia for jump school. I was assigned to class nine. The following Monday, which was a week away, I began tower week at, uh, at the jump school. And then five days after, I was recycled because I didn't qualify enough times on a 250 foot tower. The 250 foot tower was 250 feet high and they lifted you up there and then dropped you with a parachute already open. And I didn't land enough times perfectly for them to graduate me. So I had to go through another week of training, doing a bunch of more push-ups, and I finally graduated. I, I made my fifth jump on the 27th of September, and I graduated on the 28th. After that, <clears throat> we got on a bus, all of us who had signed up for special forces. I had. I had, what had happened was during AIT, we had a recruiter coming around. He was trying to recruit people for special forces training group. They had just begun training uh, people who were privates for special forces rather than just taking NCOs, which they had done before. So I got a chance to sign up for special forces while I was in AIT. And I got to Fort Bragg, North Carolina on Monday, or no, on Sunday, the 29th of September, right after jump school. In fact, it, we went down there the day after jump school uh, graduation. I was assigned to B Company of Special Forces Training Group. Now, we were told that training would consist of six weeks of uh, demolition training since I had signed up for demo. We had a choice you know, when we got down there of what we wanted to um, graduate or what we wanted to take in the way of training. I always love now loud noises, so I, I selected demolition training. The choices were you know, weapons. You could do either heavy weapons or light weapons. And the communications. And when I got to training group, I noticed 
the guys that were taking the communications training were all dreaming in dits and dots. They were, they had so much Morse code in their mind that they, they were constantly talking and sleeping in Morse code. And then the other course I could have gone through was the medical course. I didn't want to do that because that was a very lengthy course. Uh, and they, they took training not only at Fort Bragg, but also down in Texas at Fort Sam Houston. They went through a lot of training. And, and I will tell you, the medics and special forces, I trusted them with my life. They were fantastic. They were experts in their field. And in fact, during the time of training, uh, they actually put them to work in hospitals. So they, they, now when I began my, my demolition training, actually I didn't begin it until quite a few months. We, uh, when we got down there, we were constantly doing details like uh, hauling garbage, going to the ammo dump and, and picking up all the cartridges, spent cartridges, you name it, they had a detail for it. And it included mobile uh, mowing the lawns. So eh, that was kind of boring, but I think it was part of the reason or, or part of a, the training that we went through to make us a Green Beret showing that we could do anything and, and through boredom, whatever, we could handle the situation. When we got there, there were 55 special forces people or recruits on the bus. And as of the, the 29th, which was or the third, which was two days after that, of the 55 recruits we had, 15 had already quit. Now, when you listen to the uh, music of Barry Sadler's uh, Green Beret song, he talks about how many were dropped from the course. I think he said out of 100, it was only three passed. And I saw that happening. I saw a lot of people quitting. And, and some people just not making it uh, because it required a lot of intelligence and a lot of hard work. So <clears throat> I made it through that. I participated in my sixth jump on the 16th of October, jumping from a uh, de Havilland Caribou, which was a propeller driven plane. On the 23rd of October, our company was put on alert because of Cuba. The Cuban invasion was, was what, what caused that. There were fences all over the place, barbed wire, set up around the 5th and the 7th Special Forces Group, as well as the 82nd Airborne, which was there at Fort Bragg. All of us were put on alert, even though I hadn't been sent to a team yet. I was placed on alert. The 31st of the month was payday. I got all of $36. And they said, I'd get the rest the following month. So I didn't have much money to spend on anything. November 9th, I got paid $30 of what they owed me. Now, on the 11th, I started reading a book called Mao Tse Tung on guerrilla warfare. It was a book that was highly recommended by 
Special Forces cadre there. On the 16th, the company was still on alert, but changed to a, a three-hour alert, or from a three-hour alert to a six-hour alert. What that meant was we could go anywhere we wanted to, but we had to be able to be back in six hours and travel no further than 50 miles and leave a telephone number to be contacted in, in case we were dispatched somewhere. On the 17th of November, my name still was not on the training list. And there was supposed to be a class starting then. So I went to the first sergeant and griped to him about it. He immediately put me on the list. And we were taken off the alert file at that time also. At some time between the 12th of November and the 1st of December, the reason I know that is because I wrote home and I, I put my return address. They changed the name of training group from provisional to airborne. So rather than saying special forces training group provisional, it was special forces training group airborne. The provisional was because the army had not yet certified that particular course as a, uh, a full-time course, but they finally did while I was there. On Monday, the 3rd of December, I was sent on a field exercise. I was acting as a gorilla in Pineland. Pineland is where Special Forces had their final training. And I was a guerrilla there who was supposedly under the command of a Special Forces team that was sent out there. They were out there for training purposes, and it was the last week before they graduated. So I was a guerrilla out there for, for a week. They returned from the field on the 7th and the following Tuesday, I actually began demolition training. That first day we set off explosives and it snowed all day. The following day, the temperature was 17 degrees until noon and they reached a high of 32. So we were pretty cold out in the field. On the 13th, we went to the demolition range. The morning temperature was five degrees and the sand and dirt was frozen, frozen solid. On the 22nd of December, I began my Christmas leave and I flew home to San Jose, California. Christmas leave was over on the 4th of January and I signed into my company at Fort Bragg. On the 21st, we went to the field to Camp McCall. Camp McCall had just tents set up. Actually, we set up our own tents using our own ponchos. They did not yet have any buildings at Camp McCall. So I went through field exercise, demolition field exercise that week and returned to Fort Bragg on the 24th. On the 25th, I graduated from demolition training. Well, in the top half of the graduates, there were 63 men who began the course and only 35 graduated from it. I was then given the combat engineer 
MOS, Military Occupation Specialist. It meant I was a con combat engineer. And my secondary MOS then was a 112, which was heavy weapons. So I had two Special Forces MOSs. In March, two months later, I worked the Area 2 demonstration all week. We had a demonstration and a demonstration area at Fort Bragg where we brought out people of an important nature, uh, such as generals, you name it. Anybody who was a VIP came out there and watched that demonstration. A week later, I returned to Fort Bragg and began my five weeks of branch training. Branch training again was the final training. The last week of that training, we went out to Pineland and acted as advisors to our guerrilla force. I graduated on Friday the 26th of April. I was fourth in the class of 150. The next week, May, I was assigned to Company D, 7th Special Forces Group, and I was assigned to an A team, numbered A-42. In July, we, I take it back, in June, we went on a field exercise that was similar to the branch training field exercise. And we stayed out there for about a week and a half before returning. <clears throat> On July 1st, they had formed the 6th Special Forces Group. And I learned just before that that our company in the 7th Special Forces Group was supposed to go to the 6th Special Forces Group. Actually, we stayed in the same barracks, but it was labeled the 6th Special Forces Group. And we became Company A of the 6th Special Forces Group. And my team number was A6 under the B team that was signified as B2. A week after that, we were told that we were going to be training to go to Ethiopia. It seems that Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, had gone to John F. Kennedy's funeral and we had a lot of special forces men there at the funeral. He noticed our people and he said, I want those people to come to my country to train my troops on their type of fighting. So we were assigned, four teams were assigned to go through the pre-mission training at Fort Bragg. So we began that the next, the following week. On the 15th of July, I was finally authorized my secret security clearance. I'm sure the reason it took so long for me to get that was because I had lived in Ireland and Sweden and I had a Swedish pen pal still. And in addition to that, in high school, I made friends with a Russian. He was actually from uh, the Middle East, 
he was living in the Middle East because his father was working there in the oil fields. So he became a friend also. So having a, a communist friend, I'm sure, was one of the reasons that it took so long for me to get my secret clearance, the final. In August, a group of us traveled to Lake Kerr, Virginia for a two-week construction TDY exercise to learn how to do construction. Now, we did such a good job that after we left, they redlined the building that we built. They said it was unsafe for anybody to be inside, so... I guess we didn't do a very good job. A week later, we returned. Oh, by the way, while we were there, I was returning to our bivouac area and I saw a snake go across a path right in front of me. It was a copperhead. I told the guys about it and what had happened was I had watched that copperhead and it went into a pile of rocks. So I told the guys where it went and we went out with a search party and we started pulling all the rocks off of the pile. Lo and behold, we ran into a nest of copperheads. One of the guys grabbed one of the copperheads and put them in a burlap sack. And we decided to take that copperhead back to our barracks at Fort Bragg. We had him in a cage at our barracks at Fort Bragg and we were continually feeding him. And finally, the commanding officer of our unit heard about the Copperhead and said, I don't want a poisonous snake in my barracks. So he made us give it away. We we had one of the guys in the group who, in fact, had a, uh, a friend who had a rattlesnake ranch. So we gave him the copperhead. In September, we continued with orientation and area study of Ethiopia. And a couple months later in December, or no, of no November, we began Amharic language training. Amharic has about a hundred uh, letters in its alphabet. They go by sound rather than, well, they, they go by sound. And because of that, we never learned how to read Amharic. We only learned how to speak Amharic. And we, we spoke it fairly well. In fact, we were, we were taught by some Ethiopian college students who were there taking courses. So they were the ones that taught us. Now on Friday, the 6th of December, we had our final day of language training. And then a couple of months later, in March, we were still training for Ethiopia. On the 6th of March, we had an eight-hour training session on how to pack and saddle horses and mules because it seemed that besides camels, in Ethiopia, they used mules and horses to pack equipment places. So we, we got riding instructions as well as instructions on how to pack and saddle a, a horse and a mule. On the 10th of March, 
we went to the range for firing. We fired 60 millimeter mortars, 81 millimeter mortars, and four deuce millimeter mortars, as well as 57 and 106 millimeter recoilless rifles. That was for our Ethiopian trip, we learned that. The following month, the 8th of April, we went through, we departed Pope Air Force Base. Now, you would have thought that they would have flown us in jets, but they didn't. They loaded us on board two Globemaster aircraft, C-124s, propeller-driven aircraft, slower than could be. In fact, it took us three days to get from Pope Air Force Base, North Carolina, to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We made stops in the Azores where we spent the night. Also, we made a stop at uh, oh, Khartoum at Wheelis Air Force Base. And we spent the night there. We moved uh, the next, the following day, we flew into Ethiopia with a stop in Sudan, Khartoum, Sudan, actually. Uh, we stayed at a place called Mapping Mission. Mapping Mission was a, and uh, it was all military, but the people dressed in civilian clothing, but they didn't wear all civilian clothing. Their shoes were military issue boots. And some of them even wore some of their fatigue pants. So since this was a secret mission, our commanders decided we needed to move out of there immediately because they didn't want us to look military at all. So we were moved to a hotel in downtown Addis Ababa. Now this hotel had a, a square in the middle of it that people could gather. And we had been invited by Haile Selassie to come to his palace to welcome us into country. Before we went there, we went to the American embassy so they could tell us how to act while we were in the palace. We made a formation in the square in the middle of that hotel. Now, in that hotel were a bunch of red Chinese acrobats. They had gone to Addis Ababa to put on a show. And you talk about a lot of people hanging out of windows, taking pictures. We had, we were in class A uniforms, green berets and all. And we got photographed by those red Chinese and it was still a secret mission. So anyway, that, after, that day we went and we saw Haile Selassie. He was a very small man and he came and he shook each of our hands. We put on a demonstration for him, something like the Gabriel demonstration at Fort Bragg. And he thoroughly enjoyed it. And he gave us drinks. We toasted him. I'm sure it was the most expensive champagne in country that we toasted him with. So then that was over with. We finally left 
the palace in the afternoon, late afternoon, and went back to our hotel. Captain, while we were there <clears throat> the first day, Captain James and Staff Sergeant Coffin flew down to Nigeli, which is where we were going to be stationed. Our A team was going to be in a village in southern Ethiopia, far away from any other Americans. The first two men went down there to make sure that the house that had been set up for us would be okay for us. And they gave the okay. So the next day, the remainder of the team got on an aircraft and flew down there. And what we had was a two-bedroom house for 12 of us. It was jam-packed. In fact, in the in the living room, we had six cots set up. And in the other three bedrooms were two cots in each one. So it was a pretty crowded household. We were a, we hired a, a a man to keep the kitchen clean. And during the time we were there, we found out he was using the same water to wash our utensils and plates and bowls with the same water that he used to wash the toilet. So that was that was something else when we found that out. We immediately told him, stop using that water. And by the way, the place we got the water was a well. And the well was to completely surrounded by cattle. And you had to watch out for the cattle poop when you got water out of the well. We used a rope and we lowered our... Yeah. Yeah. Our, our bucket into the well and filled it up and brought it up and then put it on transportation to to get it to our team house. Now that particular place had a, a generator, but the generator was a very old generator that came from Germany. And because it was so old, they only ran the generator for electricity for nighttime. They didn't do any electricity during the day. In order to send messages, we had a, a, a radio that required somebody to hand crank to give the radio electricity. And the two lowest men rank-wise were selected for it. I was one of those two. So I got plenty of exercise cranking that hand generator. And I always swore that those communicators added some extra words just so we could get some more exercise. As soon as we got there, we were invited to a party thrown by the Ethiopians. Now, one of the things we were taught was in the States was as Green Berets, hmm. when we went anywhere, we ate their food and we drank their liquids. So at that party, we got a taste of you know what they considered to be booze. It was very sweet. And it, it came in bottles. And we also had their local food. 
the local food consisted of a piece of raw meat dipped in a very hot sauce. And it was known as a Jarawat. The dip and the and the the raw beef. We in fact went to a party later in a tent where the cow was tied up outside of the tent. And while we were in the tent, the cow was killed and butchered. And we were fed that cow's raw beef, not cooked at all. I was happy that I was not an officer because the officers got the best part of a, of a cow, the cow's tongue. And that looked gross, believe me. The next thing we did was we, we were considered to be VIPs at a Liberation Day party in downtown Addis, or downtown Nigeli. Nigeli was a, a, a small village and it had all dirt in it. And it had a few bars in it because it was outside of the Ethiopian outpost. Now the Ethiopian outpost <laughs> had three battalions assigned to it. But the three battalions all stayed in a different place. One of the battalions was stationed at the Somali border, which we were fairly close to. It was about a half day drive to get to the border. And that's where one of the battalions was. A second battalion was in the Congo, acting as police for the supposed peaceful occupation of the Congo. So that particular battalion marched into the square for the celebration. And we had seats right in front because we were the VIPs for that. It was a, a pretty nice situation. I was finally promoted to E4, specialist fourth class. I was promoted three days after that particular parade, but I didn't find out until a week after the parade that I had been promoted. Shortly after that, our team sergeant, Master Sergeant Dexter, was sent to the B team, which was way far north. Like I said, we were in the middle of nowhere. All the other A teams were in northern Ethiopia. One of them, in fact, on the Agadan Desert. And the B team was also way far north. And the road that we had to travel to get to where we were was a dirt road full of ruts. In June, we began receiving $30 a month. Or no, in June, I began getting $30 a month because I passed the propay test. We, we received... Uh, a uh, rations not available uh, TDY pay, and I forget how much it was, but it was over and above what we normally were paid. In June, in the middle of June, I went to Addis Ababa on a week-long R&R. &R. We were all permitted to go to Addis on R&R. &R. My transportation was in 
a Ethiopian three quarter ton truck. It took all day to get from where we were to Addis Ababa. And I stayed in a hotel there for the week. And I purchased a lot of goodies there to take home, including an ivory uh, lamp, which was not very expensive considering. Okay, I got to, the day after I arrived there, I got to make a parachute jump from a de Havilland beaver. I don't know if you're familiar with a beaver, but it it's a single engine and it's a very small aircraft. You can load about six jumpers in it. Well, we had a man who was jump qualified, who was stationed at MAG there, Military Assistance Advisory Group. And there was another man there who was airborne qualified, who wanted to jump also. And I got to jump. I was the number one man. The number one man, as the aircraft was flying, got out of the aircraft and put one hand on the strut that was holding the wing and another hand on the aircraft itself, flying along with the aircraft. And when we got to the drop zone, I just released and dropped from the aircraft. And I made a, a pretty good parachute landing there. I returned to Nelly and Nigeli two weeks after I had arrived. And the reason I was so late was because the weather was fouling everything up. And all they had was a dirt strip at Nigeli for an aircraft to land on. And the roads were too muddy to travel on. So I got to ride on a, a, a Cessna, twin engine Cessna, down to Nigeli. And the pilot decided to give me a a nice scenic trip. We went over one area that had a bunch of flamingos flying, and that was something to behold. We landed at Nigeli, and as soon as we landed, I found out I was due to go to the field for field training for the battalion that we were training. And while I was there, our CO was transferred to the B team. So we had lost our commanding officer and our CO, our, C, our CO and our team sergeant to the B team. So we were kind of shorthanded. We had just 10 men there. In July, we finished the first cycle with the uh, with the battalion, and we waited for the second battalion to arrive to start their training. In the meantime, a couple of Peace Corps members stopped in the village and stayed a few days while while they were awaiting transportation to Nairobi, Kenya. Now, one of the things that we had there was south of us was considered to be enemy territory. Actually, everywhere was, was considered to be enemy territory because they had shifters, which were gangs of bandits who would rob individuals. Whereas if you had a convoy with some soldiers in it, they wouldn't touch you. And because of that area south of us being so uh, barren, 
and having a lot of shifters in it. That's that's why we had to go in groups to be on the safe side. Okay, in August, we lost our head medic. So that was three people gone. In September, I got another R and R to Addis Ababa. By this time, we had decided that two men would go together on the trips, and we were heavily armed. We got to Addis Ababa. Well, we drove to Addis Ababa. On the way there, <clears throat> I was driving, and this donkey runs out in front of the Jeep. And I didn't have time to do anything. I hit the donkey in its buttocks. I made the mistake of stopping. <clears throat> now, in Ethiopia, every tribe had its own language. You had a hundred different languages in the country. When I stopped, we were surrounded. Our Jeep was surrounded by about a dozen tribesmen with their lances, their spears. And they said, we didn't know what they were saying. They wouldn't let us go. We couldn't understand anything they said. And we had our interpreter on board with a, with a Jeep. He couldn't understand what they were saying. Thankfully, a man who worked for the road department who spoke their language saw what was happening and stopped to talk to us. Well, I thought that because he said that the tribesmen said we could go to the next village and drive on while they would stop there and see the village chief to make sense of what was going to happen if we owed them money or whatever. And, and our interpreter said that the road person said that we could just drive on. Well, I did. And beyond the village, I noticed that the vehicle that that road person was in and that had some of the tribesmen in it was still following us beyond the village. So I figured, uh-oh, he wants to stop us. And I didn't want to stop, so I raced on. And we finally got into traffic and lost them, probably about halfway to Addis Ababa. So that was something I didn't want to go through again. Uh, we went, oh, one of the first things I did after arriving back there was I purchased a miniature deer and I was going to keep that miniature deer as a pet. And he made a fine pet. He got used to me. He followed me around. He got to the point where we didn't even have to keep him tied up. So, and, and that deer, by the way, was something that the Ethiopians loved to eat. But he was my pet. So I kept him under wraps. We went hunting because that was the only way we could get food the the marketplace itself had food that was really dangerous and we didn't want to eat that so we went out and hunted for our food what we what we generally ate was guinea fowl leopard anything we could shoot in fact one time uh smitka he was a he was a demolition sergeant on our team. He and the village chief went hunting. The village chief 
had an AK-47. Schmitka had an M1 Garand, which is what we carried over to Ethiopia, by the way. Our main weapon was the M1 Garand, and our backup was a 45. So he was out there hunting with this village chief. The village chief got out and made the first fire. No, Smitka got out with his M1 and fired a bullet which wounded the lion. The lion was in attack mode and came towards him. And thankfully, the village chief was able to empty his ammunition into that tiger and killed him. So they loaded the tiger on board. No, it wasn't, I'm sorry, it wasn't a tiger. It was, it was a, oh shoot. It was uh, something that charged. I forget what it was now, but it was an animal and it was big. And we got it back to camp or back to the team house and cut it up in pieces. And we had that for a few meals. Now, we we went uh, hunting a lot. And most of the time it was south of a, the camp. And one time I managed to hit a guinea fowl with one, I killed two guinea fowl with one bullet. <clears throat> Nobody in our group had ever done that before. But the problem was I hit the first guinea fowl with my M1 cartridge and the guinea fowl just was in pieces. Nothing to eat. But that guinea fowl being shot hit another guinea fowl that was behind him and killed it, so that's what we ate. We were, <clears throat> Smitka and I were assigned to teach driving to <clears throat> the particular men in the battalion who were picked for that. So we spent a week giving driving lessons to these people who had never driven. In fact, hardly anybody in Ethiopia knew how to drive because all of their transportation was mules or camels. And that's usually what was used. In fact, we had, a, uh, we had an iron in our team house that was a charcoal iron because because we didn't have much electricity. We only had it at night. So we used charcoal irons. The way we got charcoal was a man would sell it to us and he'd deliver it on board a camel. So we had camels coming to us, delivering our charcoal about once a week. After that driving test, the Ethiopians threw a big party for us and we enjoyed it. It was, it was outside and it was a lot of fun. In October, we finally finished training the 3rd Battalion and we had a big party celebrating their graduation. The brigade commander threw a party as well, as did the brigade. The brigade. Then we finally were able to get on the road, traveling north to Addis Ababa. We, we actually were able to 
get on an airplane to fly there. And we were once again invited to the embassy and the palace and shook hands with His Royal Highness again. So that was the second time that I got to shake a very important man's hand in person. Back in the, what we had was when we got to Addis Ababa, we found out that we were going to be traveling on one C-135, which was a jet. Now, one of the teams had gotten a pet leopard. And the crew said that we weren't permitted to take any animals on board. So we talked to our medics and we found out how to knock out, how to temporarily knock out my little deer and the leopard using medication. The leopard had to be put on board the day before we left. And my little duker was put in a sack as carry-on baggage. When we got up in the air, somebody, one of the crew members went down into the hold and he smelled something. It sounded, it smelled like poop. So needless to say, he checked to find out where it was coming from. And he found that leopard. And he said, okay. He made an announcement to the whole team. We cannot take any animals in the United States. Animals must be offloaded before we reach the United States. So thankfully, I found some people that wanted my duker at Wheelis Air Force Base, where our first stop was. And I gave them the duker. And uh, the other team, when we stopped in uh, uh, the capital of Spain, he offloaded his tiger there and he gave it to the zoo there. So we no longer had any animals. Now, because we had so much luggage, we were told that we would only be able to take half of the, the baggage on board the aircraft. And the half that we had to take on board was all our uniform and equipment and any personal belongings had to be put in a foot locker and put in military assistance advisory groups, MAGS, um, building, warehouse for shipment later. I guess <clears throat> that MAG got so pissed off at us doing such a good job because they said that the, the Ethiopians could not be trained well and we managed to train them well. So that word got back to Mag and, and they were told that they needed to straighten up and fly right and they were mad. And for that reason, our baggage was never forwarded. We never got the baggage. And I had some great stuff that I had purchased that was in that. I, I do have some rugs, tapestries actually, that I purchased over there that I managed to put in my foot locker, in my personal, or, yeah, into our equipment baggage. So it would be transported. So I have those, but I have none of the other stuff that I purchased. 
So that was our trip to Ethiopia. When we got back, because, uh, by the way, while we were training to go to Ethiopia, the third special forces group was formed. And their mission was supposed to be Africa and the Middle East. And because we had already begun our training, we were kept in the six special forces group and sent over to Ethiopia. And when we got back to the United States, we were immediately transferred to the third special forces group because we had already been in Africa. And that was the group that was now in charge of Africa. So we went to the third special forces group. And uh, four days after I was assigned to special forces group, we jumped into Luzon drop zone and hiked back to Fort Bragg. On the 20th of January, Oh, no, wait. After that, in the middle of January, we went through some training on marching. We found out that our group and, and many others in, in other special forces groups were handpicked to be in a parade the inauguration parade for President Johnson. Now, many of you probably know Special Forces was never trained to march. We got a little bit of training before we went up to Washington, D.C. and marched in the inaugural parade. And one of the things that happened was in front of us was a marching band from a college. In back of us was a marching band from the military. They were both playing at the same time. And the college band was playing some faster music. And the military band was playing march music. Well, the poor guys in front and in back heard that music and they couldn't march in step because they were hearing different music. So the picture of us marching in Washington, D.C. was really ridiculous because we were so far out of step, it's unbelievable. Okay, February 14th, 1965, I re-enlisted for another three years. And the next month, March, I was assigned TDY to Fort Belvoir, Virginia to go to the engineer NCO school there. That was pretty much a requirement because we were now considered to be not demolition specialists, but engineers. And all our training had been in demolition. So we, we didn't know anything about engineering. So we were sent to Fort Belvoir, Virginia to, to go through training for engineering. And I began my training on Monday, the 15th of March. And I spent a lot of time traveling on weekends. We had weekends off, so I always traveled back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, because I had a I was renting a house there 
even though I was single, I was permitted to live off base. And I rented a house there and I went back to take care of it. And drinking the NCO club, of course. In May or in June, I found out that Sergeant Major Standridge, my B team Sergeant Major in Ethiopia, was going to Vietnam in three to four months. And of the 42 enlisted men that were on our A team and B team that went to Ethiopia, 20 to 25 of them, more than half, were scheduled to go to Vietnam. I graduated later that month in June, on the 23rd of June. In July, our unit began very vigorous training program, which included several days of swimming and life-saving. Two weeks after we began that, we were transported by truck, deuce and a half trucks, to Fort Fisher, North Carolina. Fort Fisher now was on the coast. We went there to get trained by the US Navy SEALs on swimming and how to operate a rubber raft for insertion and to leave from the coast. So it, it meant learning how to ride a raft with the waves and against the waves. There were many times that, that the waves hit us sideways and, and knocked us over. So we got very wet during all that training. A week later, we returned to Fort Bragg and began mountain operation training, which included cliffside repelling and helicopter repelling. Helicopter repelling was done off a 34 foot tower without the side on it. Whereas the other repelling was jumping off the side down the bottom. I got really good at repelling on the helicopter repel. So later on I was made to instruct the group that I was going through training with on the, that repelling. On the 11th of August, we trained for, oh no, we, we flew on a commercial aircraft to the Colorado Rockies, to Colorado Springs. Colorado. We were there to train the, oh, what is it? The, uh, it was Special Forces uh, National Guard unit, Second Special Forces Reserve A team we were supposed to train there. So we had to pick a number, a small amount, about six or eight of uh, the men from the uh, fifth mechanized division that was there. And they were going to act as our guerrillas and we were going to act as the uh, people who ran the 
the actual uh, testing. And what we did was I, I got a small group and we headed down to a place called Beulah, Colorado. We parked the car in Beulah and then we hiked up the steep mountainside in the Colorado Rockies. And I selected a spot for us to make for our campground for our gorilla outfit. And a few days later, the special forces group came in with their A team. And they trained the men that I had selected in special forces tactics and guerrilla warfare. Towards the end of that training, I got bit by a dog. The owner of the dog refused to have a quarantine. The sheriff refused to quarantine it. The army said, okay, James, you are going to get shots. Those shots were ridiculous. I started, I had my first shot on board the commercial airliner going back to Fort Bragg. The shots were put in the stomach and they traded sides. One day, one side, the other day, the other side. And if I remember correctly, it was somewhere around 10 shots that I had to have. Those shots made me so sick, I could not hold anything down. And I spent about two weeks where I could not do anything. And in fact, my, my team at Fort Bragg said, just stay home. Don't even bother coming in. When you're well enough to come in, then you can come in. So I did that. And in the meantime, I lost a lot of weight. Later on, after that, I was placed on a demonstration team. It's something like a demonstration team that makes a demonstration at uh, Gabriel Demonstration Area at, at Fort Bragg, where you get 12 men that are a, an A-team standing up on a, a stand and stepping out, giving their name in a foreign language as well as what their job was. And then the second man would do the same thing. All of us had a different job and all of us had a different language that we spoke. It was because I spoke Amharic that I was selected for that team because it was an unusual language for anybody to know. So what I did was I came up, when it came my turn, I stepped forward and I said, and that's basically, I am the engineer in Amharic. And I went through the other stuff also that described what my job entailed. And we did that. And I was selected to go on that team that traveled. The first place we went to was Fort Knox, Kentucky, where we, we put on a demonstration for some officer trainees that were there. The next place we went to was the Texas State Fair. 
in Dallas, Texas. We were put up in a motel there and we spent a week doing that demonstration. And we do a demonstration about every hour. And it was funny. This one time, I noticed some Ethiopian officers in the crowd. And when it was my turn, I made sure that they heard me and I faced them. And I yelled out, in a Iwigya Mahandis. And they just turned and looked at me. They were so surprised to see someone that was speaking Amharic in the United States. And then when that was over with, I had volunteered to go to Vietnam. I had called Mrs. Alexander in the Pentagon to volunteer because all of my requests to go to Vietnam through channels was refused. So Mrs. Alexander said, I'll take care of this immediately. And within a week, she had me scheduled for pre-mission training for Vietnam. And I found out that it had been okayed the day after we returned from Dallas and the Texas State Fair. So I started my training a day late, but I started it. And the training was very interesting. We, we went, we learned the, the Vietnamese language because special forces always learn the language of the country they were going to. So that if their interpreter wasn't there, they could at least get a point across in the foreign language. So I went through all that training for language as well as for what to expect in Vietnam, which included what kind of training I was going to be putting the troops through. And that was, that was some really good training. It taught me about what to expect. in Vietnam and how to handle it. We were reminded that when we were in Vietnam, we would not be in charge, except in certain situations. We were considered to be advisors only and act in an advisory capacity. But there were some times when I was in Ethiopia that I took charge because the person who was supposed to be in charge wasn't doing his job. So I had to take over the job. And that happened fairly frequently. In fact, in my first camp at Kai Kai in Vietnam. But anyway, we were, we were taught as we were in our pre-mission training for Ethiopia, we were taught all about the geography of the company, the country, what to expect and how to advise the troops that we would be advising. So, that basically ends my talk about Ethiopia and pre-Vietnam. All righty. Um, I mean that uh, that that I mean that that's uh, about as a, a great as an introduction as we could have ever hoped for. And quite frankly, I was hoping that you would go in depth 
like that because you uh i mean and that that's just vietnam and we're in an hour and a half right now so uh, (laughs) it it is absolutely amazing and as we were saying before we went live we're gonna end up doing a a two-parter um and i i was gonna let folks uh for today if we wanted to to knock out uh or go over a few questions uh i've got some pictures that i can show but uh i was thinking considering we covered so much uh for a part two we could cover vietnam and then uh get into a full question and answer uh since so much was covered in part one all right so um guys if y'all want to get some questions in um while i'll i'll get the ball rolling i'll bring up some pictures and uh, y'all get some questions in, and we'll go a little bit longer before we uh, uh, shut down until part two. Um, let's see here. Um, I do have some photos um, that Mr. Dick was so gracious to share with me since we were talking about animals early. I always love Special Forces men and their animals. Um, we've got the little leopard right here, I believe. Yeah, in fact, uh, that guy was an, uh, an Air Force officer, and he took me to that farm that had a bunch of baboons and that little leopard. Oh, wow. And he ended up taking that leopard home with him to his family. It, so he was those able baboons. I, I'll tell you, those baboons. <laughs> I would not have wanted to have fight fought one of those because those guys could be vicious. And uh, they were tied up. Each one of them had an individual stake in this little farm. I've heard some some stories and I've I've seen it on, on National Geographic. People just underestimate them. And you know, we've gotten so accustomed with Disney and all of that, and you know, with the Berenstein right. Bears and the and the uh uh and yogi and all that and they've gotten to, to where monkeys and 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 bears are so friendly and all that boy monkeys will, will, will tear you up and the same with bears i mean mm-hmm. monkeys uh have especially those silverbacks uh the the the, the baboons are, are grossly uh over strength for their size uh, it, it's ridiculous I, I i dang sure don't want any part of any monkeys as a matter of fact, something that I forgot to mention on on one of our field problems, I went out uh, into the field in Ethiopia and was doing some uh, some lessons on explosives. And I placed a bunch of explosives in trees in the field. And then we walked back. It was set on a timer. And we walked back to what I consider to be a safe distance and blew up all those explosives. And what we found after that was something else. It was a bunch of small monkeys that had been killed by those explosives and those ethiopians were so happy to see those dead monkeys because they figured (laughs) that was a meal for them in fact several meals Uh i i hated to to even find out that i killed all those monkeys um, is this one of is, is this one of the the baboons right here uh, that pictured? Yep. Okay. Yeah. That. I mean, I hate to say it. I, I love animals, but boy, he looks like he's mean. He he. he oh looks yeah. Mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thing, didn't want to I mean, mess with them. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, there was uh. Gosh, let me show the deer because we do have some questions coming in, but I wanted to cover all our uh, animal uh, that I had 
handy. Um, and this is a great one. I showed another one of you feeding him by the bottle, but yeah, I named him Sam. Sam. Any, any particular reason for Sam? No. Just he he was just a Sam. I like that. Yeah. And so uh, the, the the Air Force guy was able to get his his pet home, but but y'all were not able to get the deer home. No, uh, I was hoping to get him home. What had happened was I I dropped it off at at that person's house, at that family's house, and I got their address and I wrote to them several times. They never wrote back. So apparently they had fallen in love with Sam mm. too and did uh, not want to return him. I was and about to speaking say. Speaking of that, the team that got the the uh, the cheetah it was, they, they tried to get it back to the United States. And the zoo kept saying it's on our property it belongs to us so even though headquarters for special forces back there back at north uh, fort bragg was trying so hard they could not get it back to here i, I hate hearing those stories there's a uh... A lot of there, there's several saw guys that sadly, uh, Jerry Shriver being one of them that you know, sadly he died and his two dogs were looked after. Uh, one of them looked after, and there's rumors he made it back, but there's uh, some pretty good sources saying that unfortunately the Vietnamese shot and killed him and ate him. So, uh, I like to, be, I, I, I like to believe that the happier side that that uh, Colonel. Maggie got him home to North Carolina, uh, but it, it looks like the Vietnamese shot and killed Klaus, sadly. Um, yeah. But here's our photo of uh, your your cheetah right here, isn't it? Or with the Air Force uh, man? Yeah, but he would, that was a different cheetah. Oh, wow. Okay. Boy, he looks feisty as can be right there. Oh, Ooh. he was mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He that that Air Force man's mighty brave getting that getting getting that close. Uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be too afraid of that. I love that bush hat yeah. he's got. Those Air Force Aussie bush hats are top right. notch. Um. Okay, let's get to the viewer questions. Uh, I've, since we you've been so gracious, we we can go over photos in part two. In fact, that'll be a big part of uh, part two because you've got just one of the most outstanding Vietnam collection of photos that I've ever seen. SOG wise, uh, it, including SOG force recon men that I know you, you have got one heck of a photo collection. Um, by the way, uh, we've got EM, uh, Burling line. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, he's, he's one of my friends. Yep. Yeah, he <laughs> was wanting me to, uh, say he's, uh, known Dick for many years. He's the most humble and quiet guy yet. Every time we've had a conversation, my God, but what I would, I would learn something about our history. So absolutely. I could not agree more. I wanted to let him know or let you know that he was, uh, watching with us currently and is live in the chat. So, um, Hi. But we will get to some questions now. Let's see here. Yeah, everybody's talking about your uh, the 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 dysentery and the parasites from eating all that foreign food. That's one thing I I give y'all props for having guts of steel to be able to eat what y'all eat over there. Uh, partly to be you know the special forces men that y'all were to to be courteous and and show respect. But whew, that that's some tough yeah, stuff. In fact. Uh it was it was amazing. Uh, I never got any kind of an infection from eating their food. We had one man that did, and that was uh, a Negro on our team who used to go into the village, and he got every kind of worm imaginable. <laughs> 
gosh, some some guys are just unlucky, and he, it sounds like he he, he was on the bad end of the luck stick, so to speak. If he would have, if he would have said, "I'm running for district chief of that village," he would have made it <laughs> because the people there loved him. Wow, he was yeah, a that, big guy. That, that is so. I, I love y'all getting uh, close with y'all's uh, with y'all's indigenous counterparts in the uh, in the groups around. Um, Em was saying too many people believe uh, true special forces is the war years. It's not. It's unconventional warfare. Is that ninety nine percent of war has nothing to do with battlefield of sanctioned wars. Um, yeah but which is fought out a hundred percent everywhere and it all and always at, at all times. Absolutely. Yep. Um, Mary Jo was curious about one of your great photos and I'll pull up about you and your buddy. I believe this is a Vietnam photo. Um, yeah, but she was curious, uh, oh. <laughs> that your stylish hats and what, what's going on here. Yeah. That was uh, Sergeant First Cass counselor. He was from Bastrop, Texas, which was also the home of, uh, oh, what is that? Uh, one of the famous Special Forces guys anyway. But yeah, uh, that was us going, preparing to go out on a night ambush. And that's counselor there, Art. And that's me. That hat was one of our favorite hats to wear. It just, it was wild. And he was going out with his, he had a grenade launcher there, M79. And he has all the ammunition for it in the vest there. And that is a uh, one of the uh, camouflage uh, uniforms that we had. This is me with my M16. And I also purchased a, uh, a particular scope for it. I purchased it in the United States when I was on uh, my extension r and r there and i used it pretty much to, to at least spot people so and i also this is a double uh magazine what i did was i i turned it upside down here and it, it's it feeds into there. When this is turned around, it's put in the magazine and fired off. It makes it easier to fire a lot of bullets on the first time because the first time is usually the worst time. That's when the the mad minute of firing comes up when you're when you're uh, ambushed or something. So that's why I have that that way. The other ones I have in my in my uh, suit there aren't taped together like that one is. And what I'm wearing is a, a rain jacket made out of poncho material. So that's that was to keep the rain off because that night was a rainy night. And and we knew to expect it. Is that I, uh, have, I have camouflage fatigues underneath it? I, that's what I was saying. It looks like uh, you, you've got a. Uh, I guess they call. I'm not good with the camo. I know tiger stripe and all that, but it looks like they what they you, you've got what they call the either the duck hunter camo or the rock marine camo uh, along with y'all's uh, tiger stripes. And then yeah, you, you've got, I, I don't know what that, I, I guess that may be the legging of the, either the, 
the 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 duck hunter camo or the uh, rock marine camo. That that that's really interesting combination yeah. you've got going on there. We had all sorts of different camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you pick your hat up at? I I got it there. Uh, okay. I have no idea. I don't remember who, but. I just I snatched onto it. I liked it. And, we wore I, we wore all sorts of headgear when we were over there. I, that's one thing for sure. You're uh, in, bound to find a good uh, a good picture of a SF man with some 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 strange and awesome headgear. That that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you? We always get asked, and you know we've we've not really again had the chance to ask a, um, an a camp man, how, how, how did, how did the, how did you appreciate your, your scope? Did it fare well? Did, did you use it more than often or what, what was it I going used on? It, I used it a lot because, uh, it, it was very good for enlarging anything in the distance. And I used it just as much for firing as I did for spotting the enemy. Because sometimes wow. I could spot enemy that was beyond the range of a rifle. And that was good to have to know. Wow. Okay. I'm, I've always been curious about that. And especially uh, like that, I can imagine that would be a huge help with it. Uh, with it being uh, semi wide open, with y'all's firing lanes that you've got set up at the camp, you could really hone in and 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 work, yeah. so to speak. Um, that, right. That's that, that's amazing. Do you remember what what brand uh, your scope was? Was it a Colt or? Uh, oh, I don't remember at all, and I left it back there for somebody else to use after I left Baswai. Good man. Good man. <laughs> Good man. Um, Jason, Jason Holmes would like to know, can you remember any of the men you served with on Detachment A6? I'm assuming a large number of them were Korean War vets. Were there any WW2 guys around y'all? That was one. And that was our team sergeant. Oh. And he was the only one who was World War II. In fact, he was one of the uh, first airborne people that served and uh i know one of his one of his jumps his parachute didn't open oh. and he ended up and and i don't know if he had a reserve or not but if he did that didn't open either what happened was he landed in a big bunch of bushes and he was he was injured badly, but not badly enough where he went back to jumping again. But he was in the hospital for a long time after that. And especially uh, you got on your your photo uh, on your Facebook and guys, I'll link Mister. Uh, Mr. Dick's uh, Facebook in the chat here so y'all can go ahead and find it because he's got just amazing posts uh, almost daily uh, of, of some great stuff. But what was that like, you know, when you were first getting uh, a, a lot of jumps in and uh, specifically jumping out of those king bees? I, I think you were jumping out of uh, a little bit as well as the beaver. Uh, did you have any trouble with either one did you have a favorite thing at that time that you liked jumping out of i enjoyed jumping out of the caribou caribou doing a tail jump where you just walk off the end of it and i also enjoyed helicopter jumps because that one you just pushed yourself off and and the chute opened so those were my favorites. I I hated the C one nineteen, the box car. That's what 
they used in jump school when I went through jump school was a 119. And I just hated that jump. I, to be honest, uh, jumping, uh, I've still not conquered. Uh, I get I get asked all the time to to, to go skydiving here in our, our local area, Headland. And I just uh, have not worked up the the intestinal fortitude to do it. Um, yeah. Now, is this a caribou that right here? That's a caribou with its tailgate open. Now, that particular one wasn't used for jumping. Okay. It crashed. Oh. Right after that picture. Oh. And the the pilot and co-pilot were badly burned, but saved by one of one of my teammates. And the 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 two men back in the in the rear of the aircraft were killed. Mm what happened was the load it has a load here this was a low lex attempt and it has a load there and what happened was they released the parachute the parachute opened but the load caught on the rear of the aircraft and because the parachute was out it slowed down the caribou enough where the caribou lost its flying ability and crashed into our minefield, no less. Oh. So that that was the story of that particular picture. And I really? actually got to talk to the pilot and the co-pilot uh, when I became a civilian. They uh, They called me. I mean, to, I mean, it's not bad enough you crash, but to crash in the minefield and the plane's on yeah. fire and there they, they survive. They didn't go off, thankfully. <laughs> oh, thank God. Thank yeah. God. Oh, I mean that. I mean that's your night. That that's a nightmare as a pilot. I mean, I, I can't think of anything yeah. quite worse than that, and, except for coming across a MIG while you're flying somewhere in Vietnam. I mean, well, I almost crashed uh, as a civilian pilot once I had the uh, in fact the uh, I knew the engine was on fire and it was a single engine aircraft because I could smell the smoke in the in the cockpit and as soon as I touched down on the runway the engine quit so that's how close I was to to crashing that aircraft. Oh my! I, mm, mm, mm. I, I'm uh, I, I'm really not big on the uh, on, on flying, and I, I've gotten to where I I don't even know if I'll fly again to to soar or the any of the reunions I do. I definitely know I, when I go with Terry and Vern Ward to the fifth group reunion, I'll be driving. I, I, I'm not flying anymore. I, I know that's yeah. crazy, but I, I'm, I can't get in the aircraft anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Is it because of that, uh, uh, the thing with the Boeing aircraft? Well, that, and I hate to say it, I've heard so many of you veterans, especially we've got Terry Cadden back in here. Uh, that uh, is a CCC hatchet force vet and with his helicopter crashes, he survived. And then all the other mishaps I've heard about from speaking to you guys, I'm about scared of any aircraft I can possibly find. So <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm working against a loaded deck here. Yeah. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, that's not really a question. Um, oh, uh, did you Billy Wobb being Billy from Bastrop? Yeah, yeah. That's it. I was I was thinking of either Billy or Mr. Roy Benavidez, and I I couldn't remember. And I'm glad you yeah, mentioned that. Billy. Lady. In fact, yeah. uh, Bastrop has a street named after him. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I uh, was very glad to see that. I've and I've heard there's a new memorial. I I thought I heard in the works for him at either the 
uh, ground branch, whatever you want to call the CIA side of the house or either the uh, SOCOM uh, side of the house. So uh, I'll be I'll be keeping my ear to the ground on that. Uh, that that's he's quite the man or was quite the man, I should say. Uh, oh, yeah. Did you did you come across him in Vietnam uh, any during your time? No, I did. No, the first I think time I were, ran across him was was at a convention. Okay. I think you were kind of right there as he was getting in and uh, hooked up with Mr. Paris Davis and all that before he got all shot up there at uh, Bong San uh, on that operation, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I think this is the first guest we've had who was in the military when Vietnam started. Correct me if I'm wrong there, bud. How much do you all know about the upcoming war? I know nothing about the upcoming war, but yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Dick was uh, at there the, at the very, very beginning. Uh, that's, that's the why. very beginning, but well, yeah, because the yeah. first the first time there was actually uh, a death was in 1957. But I was surprised to read about was, that in a recent history book I, I found. I was yeah. But that that there's debate whether he was actually uh, killed by a weapon or or not. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw. Whether there were considered to be military operation or not. And then I think uh, when when Kennedy got in, I was reading the part of uh, the the SEAL history or the history of the UDTs to the Vietnam era SEAL teams and. Uh, one of the first big special forces loss of life. Uh, that's when he really started getting bothered by it. And what was that? 64 ish or six, I think late 64. And he was already starting to get to where he was thinking about pulling a lot of guys out. I'm, I'm always interested in what, if he would have lived, what, how the war would have been, uh, prosecuted so to speak uh not yeah. court, not not legally if you will but i mean uh tactics and such i think it would have been a much more special forces oriented war as opposed to bringing in the marine or well, the marines needed were there very early on too but i don't think it would have spread as quite as much uh had he lived i, I think it would have he would have run a special forces war but that's yeah. that's just me um Scott, who is uh, Mr. Rich Richard Moose Gross's son of SOG and uh, the unit, uh, he says he loves your eye patch, sir. <laughs> A lot of people do. But <laughs> I figured as long as it happened, I might as well make fun of it. So I so I put the googly eye in there, and in fact, I had a uh, where I used to live in the Sierra Nevada mountains. I. I'd go to coffee every day at the coffee shop in the village there. And I had this one time I was there, I was sitting at a table and this little kid comes, little kid, I, I, I'd say he was probably about uh, four or five years old. And he walks up to the other side of the table, the table and just stands there and stares at me. And then as serious as can be, he said, are you a pirate? And everybody started cracking up. <laughs> you got, you got to love kids. You got, you got to love in fact, kids. I've, I've been thinking that uh, right here, we have uh, jet boats mm -hmm. that go up into Hell's Canyon. Mm -hmm. And, I was on that shortly after this happened. I was on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride in, in uh, Disney now, down in Southern California. And one of the guys said, you better not go on that ride because they'll think you work there and not let you leave. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, before we moved here, I, I kept thinking maybe I could be pirate of Hell's Canyon. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Scott uh, said, uh, Scott said, 
I'm uh, I, I'm I've got, I'm working with one eye also, and I need I need to get one myself. I I, I yeah. Scott, I think you uh, need to follow Slurp's lead and uh, go with uh, the eye. I think you, uh, you you get a lot of kick out of that, and I think you yeah. uh, you get some good. Everybody food. knows me. <laughs> I was about to say any anybody on Facebook uh, that that's uh, yeah. that, that's Mr. Dick's Facebook profile pi- picture that you see and you see that yeah. in your media like this guy's got to be awesome and of course oh, yeah. when you get to know him he absolutely is yeah the people <laughs> at the coffee shop I go to here they know me right away yeah <laughs> they oh, recognize yes. me all the time oh yes um. I'm copying that. Uh, we've got one or two more questions, and I accidentally read Jason's question wrong earlier uh, that I think we'll close out with because we're at the two-hour mark now, and I think that'll be a good one to to close out with. Uh, let me make sure. Yeah. Uh, let me add this. This is Mr. Dick's profile, uh, Facebook profile, if you guys would like to – Give him a follow and uh, check out his amazing shares that he does every week or nearly every day, I should say. Uh, wow, Red. Uh, Red was a Marine with the uh, the ni- uh, Ninth Marines, and huh, he was in three airline crashes, and he still flies. Well, Red, you're, oh, wow. at, at, with your backstory uh, in Chicago and in the Marines, you're a much braver man than I, much braver. So, huh. I, I I can't do it. One would have been enough for me, and I would have never gotten off the ground again, much less I probably wouldn't have climbed a ladder again. <laughs> um, Jason, okay, to close out, um, Jason meant uh, – I, I, I messed up his uh, earlier – his current war coming up. He meant how much when you were in training from Ethiopia and all that, uh, did you know about Vietnam before you were – getting set to go to Vietnam. Oh, I knew all about it because uh, Special Forces was over there the whole time I was in. In fact, uh, it was uh, during AIT when I when I signed up for Special Forces, the uh, the people there showed some videos of Vietnam and that's when I decided I wanted to go in. That's uh, it, it's uh, th- those early special forces guys, and I've just re- recently got the book on. Uh, it's named after the program. Uh, oh, Operation White Star. Um, it's a novel, but it it's gives a good good history basis on on the program, and I mean. It's amazing how early special forces were there and just the 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 bonds that uh, I mean, not only with the South Vietnamese, some guys, you know, speak uh, kind of down on the, the Vietnamese special forces. And then some say some were good, but the Montagnards, uh, the Nungs, it's just amazing how er, how y'all got over there and how well y'all adapted uh, and and worked with the indigenous uh tribesmen and uh the vietnamese um did you yeah, have we have had any? we had good and we had bad special forces vietnamese special forces over there you figure to begin with officers were assigned by their the people they knew the uh the politicians they knew got them where they were and officers were selected because they were friends of the politicians not because of what they what they were good at that happened a lot over there that's what i was curious about and as a matter of fact how i'm i had just finished a a book called war stories of the green berets um and it was a SOG man that went from uh, FOB1 to advising with the uh, Vietnamese Special Forces. And he said exactly that. He said he would probably say half of his his guys were hard chargers. Uh, you know, he'd put them in with the, yeah. the American Special Forces for their dedication, their skill, 
and uh and and brotherhood and then the other half were like they either had never even held a gun never been around a gun oh, yeah uh, you know it, it was a, just another disconnect with them you know yeah I, yeah i, I, I find uh, the cambodians were considered to be some of the hard chargers over there and uh the last camp i was at was Baswai. i was only there for a month but i was there and during that time uh our commanding officer got into an argument with the special forces with the vietnamese special forces commanding officer the vietnamese had made the mistake of of promoting the Cambodian commanding officer to captain, which was the same grade as the Vietnamese special forces commander. And they got into that argument. And when it was all over, the Cambodian special forces guy came over or the Cambodian CIDG commander came over to our commander and said, you want him dead? <laughs> and he would have done it too. <laughs> Holy cow. I, and, yeah. and, and one thing I'll add to, to, to that division uh, before we close out uh, before part two, um, the, the, this was at a uh, CIDG camp and the road was split and one side of the of the compound was mountain yards the other side was uh vietnamese special forces and the vietnamese or uh i should say the viet cong knew the animosity between the two so they started their attack by only launching mortars on one side close enough to where they could hear it and think the the other side would think it was the either the mountain yards or the vietnamese whichever side were shooting mortars trying to incite a, a riot, which they almost did. And luckily the Americans got outside, quickly dispersed and said, clearly that's coming from the wood line. And they they quickly got them and, and calmed things down and annihilated the VC uh, onslaught that was on its way. But I mean, yeah. it, it sounds like it didn't take much for a gunfight to break out but between uh, the, the various and groups. And in addition to that, we, we always knew that um, at least 15% of our CIDG were actually Viet Cong. 15%. That's a I large mean, percentage. I, I, was, I was just going to say. 10 to 15%, depending on where it was. And I mean, there's really, I mean, you're doing the best uh, vetting you can. I mean, there's really no way to get get them all out. I mean, to, to root them all out until we had to watch our back because a lot of a lot of the camp attacks started inside the camp, <laughs> not even outside. The, the, um, the, there, there's numerous, uh, and again, as we close, uh, to, to add on to that point, um, there were one of the insider attacks at a CIDG camp that was put down was started by a 16 year old, uh, assassin, a girl, they were going to, uh, roll in grenades into the Americans and she was going to slit the throat of the Vietnamese special forces commander and just die until taken out as many as they could. So I, I, I mean, yeah, y'all literally had to watch your back at all time. I mean, that is yeah. unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable. As if fighting yeah, a normal fact, war. I, I was told, I don't know how true it is, but I, I'm pretty sure the guy was right. He said that the head interpreter at my first camp, Kai Kai, was found to be a Viet Cong. And I can understand now that that he might have been true on that because I remember some things that that, uh, that guy did. And it's just, it's, it's something else. It's like when my team commander was killed at Kai Kai, 
he was killed after or during the time that that I was involved in a in a firefight outside the perimeter and um, before he was killed the head interpreter and all the Vietnamese who ran from where I was being shot at. So I was left out there by myself. And the only reason I stayed out there by myself was because the other American on a patrol had gone up near the border to do a one-man reconnaissance there, and I could not leave him. So I had to stay out there. And, and I remember that when he was an interpreter, well, I always selected him as an interpreter. And the first 10 patrols I was on, I, I was involved in firefights. And people started calling me a firefight magnet, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and I felt like one. <laughs> but when, when that guy, when all the troops ran, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, um, that 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 is some. I mean, the 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 treachery that y'all had to be careful of in inside the A camps, uh, let alone yeah. the, the fighting y'all are doing. I mean, some of the most fierce fighting. You know, Saul gets all the a lot of the the uh, the war story because you know they're in Laos all alone and all that but guys if y'all want to look at some fighting look at some of the a camps that that were attempted to overrun and even the ones that were overrun uh, we had a guest that that rescued some of the men at Lang Vey I mean the, the a camp men they didn't play they they were sent out on recon patrols they uh yeah. were were surrounded by the enemy in in a in, in Indian country, uh, oh yeah, it, it, it that was especially it, Kai Kai. Oh yeah, and and next episode we've got photos to show. I mean, uh, th th to to be quite honest, that that is that is a nightmare base to be stationed at, in my opinion, from from photos and especially during monsoon season. I I don't see how y'all did uh, how y'all did it. To be quite honest with you, <laughs> yeah. Um. But uh, we're going to close it out. Jim, absolutely. Uh, Mr. James, you are a national treasure. I could not agree uh, anymore. Uh, Jason said, I saw Dick post on Facebook once that even though his nickname is Slurp, he may have to change it to One-Eyed Dick. I laughed so hard. <laughs> how did you, uh, to yeah. close, uh, how did you uh, get the nickname Slurp or where did Slurp come from? From Kai Kai, my first camp, okay. we didn't have much storage space, so we didn't have much food. If you wanted to have seconds, you had to finish your first sooner than anybody else. One of the guys said, it's no wonder you don't eat your food, you slurp it down. And that's how my forever nickname came. Oh, I love that. I, that that is perfect, and I, uh, that makes perfect. Man, the SF nicknames are just spot on. I know. <laughs> it, 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 it's not for any, you know, it, it's not a random nickname just to be cool. It, it is just perfect, just on the nail. Yeah. Uh, um, to close out, and in fact, said, uh, oh. at my at my second <laughs> camp at. Uh, at Vinja, my commanding officer, I knew he hated this particular song. We all live in a yellow yeah, submarine. And, and I would sing it every once in a while just to get a goat. And he'd always say, he wouldn't say Staff Sergeant James. He'd say, Slurp. I'm going to send you on a one-man patrol across the border. <laughs> and that was always his retort. <laughs> he and Love I got that. along great. <laughs> Yellow submarine. That, that's, uh, I love that. That's perfect. Uh, EM uh, says, 
sat and wrote with you there at the coffee shop. You were writing yeah. Slurp Sins, and I was writing The Eternal War. Um, right. Ask Dick about 99% yep. of lunch. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely be getting into that part for 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 part two, and as well as the the many photos. Um, is there? A, we're at the wow, two hours and fifteen mark already. It it went by quick. Um, do you have anything you'd uh, like to close with before we uh, shut part down? Uh, part one down. Not that I can think of. Okie dokie, guys. Well, um, I will get with uh with Mr. Uh, Rick and uh, we'll figure out a part two. We've got a, a pretty packed schedule for the first of February. So it might be the uh, second or third week, but as soon as we can, we're going to get him back on uh, because we, we've got a lot more to cover and some amazing photos with a, a lot of great stories behind them. So I thank everybody for watching. Uh, thanks bud and pirate Dick for this great show. Can't wait for part two. Um, well, you guys have a great evening. Uh, again, Mr. Dick, thank you for joining us. And, um, if you want to stick around when I end and we'll see if we can maybe line up a uh, part two scheduling, uh, while we're on here. Um, but, uh, I'm shutting it down. You guys have a great evening and, uh, we'll catch y'all for part two.